Welcome everyone, good that you're watching to our new series, Deep Talks, Critical Conflicts. Uh, and today we'll be talking about resistance in Belarus. The largest anti-government protest in the history of Belarus broke out last year, and today the protest movement is ongoing, just as the wave of government repression and human rights violations of people who speak out against Lukashenko's government. What is happening at the moment, and how should we look at current events uh, to get better understanding and thorough conversation with voices from the countries itself. Um, that's what we're going, do, going to do today uh, with my guests. Uh, on Zoom, I have Janis Kaczynski, and here is Senior Officer Foreign Affairs of the Office of Opposition Leader Svetlana Tiganuskaya. And uh, here, opposite of me, I have Jaroslav Lichnachevsky. He's an entrepreneur in a digital health organization, and he lives in the Netherlands. Yeah. Welcome both. I want to start with you, uh, Janis. The uh, opposition leader, uh, Svetlana Tikhanouskaya, she is the face of the biggest protest movement in uh, Belarus, and she was put under immense pressure. She had to uh, go into exile in uh, Lithuania, and uh, you live there too, and she wants to continue her fight uh, to uh, make yeah, her fight for democracy. My first question would be, what can she and, and your office do at the moment Hello, uh, good and uh, It's a pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, and uh, the, the office of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya uh, from the very beginning uh, has a very clear uh, and set up goal. It's a new, free, fair and transparent elections that we want to achieve via, via negotiations. And as you see, we have selected a peaceful way of, of protest and a peaceful way of, of, of resistance. That's why it's, it takes some time to, to achieve it. And uh, the office of Svetlana Tikhanovska in this regard tries to uh, build up structures inside the country, because of course the protest is important. The people on the streets uh, protest and manifestate and saying uh, that, that they deserve this right to have democracy and the rule of law in the country is important. But uh, what we also do is trying to build the structures on the ground. For example, the office of Svetlana Tikhanovska has several thousand volunteers inside the country and uh, protests uh, continue even though you don't see you know people on the streets people for example join strike committees uh, independent trade unions uh, many of them nomenclatura for example join italian strikes and they also support resistance uh, by spreading information spreading their stories you know being active uh, and and doing things that that we call creative partisanships uh, they quit propaganda pro-regime organizations, they do several social media flash mobs, you know, write complaints, et cetera, et cetera. So everyone who is for changes in Belarus is involved into it. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is what we do inside the country. And of course, outside, uh, it's, it's very important to have a support from, from, from other countries, especially since uh, we are trying to solve this crisis peacefully. And in this regard, uh, we, we keep asking for uh, for three main pillars uh, that are needed for our revolution to succeed is, is uh, pressure, justice, and solidarity. So uh, we, we call for uh, foreign countries to, to support our demand for new elections, uh, to put out mm -hmm. accountability program, assistance program. Let's talk, uh, let's talk a bit later about uh, the role of yeah. the other so countries. In a, nutshell, in a nutshell, yes, it's both work inside and outside the country to make the negotiation happen that will lead to new free and fair yeah. elections. And you also mentioned there are actually a lot of other uh, options and campaigns besides uh, protesting. Um, that's uh, interesting to hear. And in, in uh, about last summer, we read uh, headlines of uh, mass protest, uh, people being uh, arrested. Um, the, the whole opposition uh, council was arrested and forced out of the country. How would you describe the situation at the moment? We see some news about protests, but not that much. So can you uh, yeah, give us a, a description? The protest over the last uh, almost 10 months, uh, nine plus months, has been has been developed, and the situation has been has been um, in some way uh, well got worse in terms of violation of human rights, of repression, and violence used towards uh, peaceful protesters. But at the same time, people of Belarus uh, inside the country support still support these changes, still support the call for changes. But on the other hand, we still have. Uh, Mm, basically, 
practically no access to television. We don't have parties inside the country, and uh, there are you know very very limited uh, you know. Uh, access uh, with the media and as, as, as you probably have heard uh, what happened lately with, with ma major independent media, Tutbai, for example. So the regime tries to shut down everything independent and tries to suppress all the forms uh, of protests. And uh, I would describe as well the situation that, um, you know, people are scared because the level of violence has increased significantly. There are very, very huge, uh, you know, repressions uh, happening. So uh, that, that's why it's so important from, from our side to, you know, build up uh, the structures, keep up the spirits of, of people inside the country. And uh, that's why the role of, as well of Western democracies are highly important. So once again, in a nutshell, people didn't give up. People uh, still demand changes, uh, but in a different forms. And, uh, and, and uh, we really hope that it will, uh, it will uh, the, the crisis will be resolved uh, as soon as possible. And you mentioned Tutbai, the media outlet. Is it correct that that's the, uh, one of the biggest media outlets of uh, uh, Belarus, the independent from the independent ones? Yeah, Tutbai. shut down right now. Yeah, it's yes. actually the biggest. The biggest, okay. Yeah. Let's go to you, uh, Yaroslav. <laughs> Good uh, that you're here. You're active for organization uh, By Soul, and it's an organization which supports uh, victims of uh, repression. Um, last August, you told me before, you supported uh, families financially who were fired from their uh, jobs uh, because of their political position. You also uh, traveled to Vilnius, Lithuania, uh, for your work, work there, and you uh, came back recently from Vilnius how would you like what do you hear about the current situation of Belarus uh, citizens uh, is it the same as uh, Johnny said can you add something uh, uh, yeah that's uh, that's pretty the same that uh, Dennis says uh, it's it's tough uh, repressions are growing um, but at the same time uh, we are trying to build structures and some kind of new institutions because when everything happened uh, in August 2020 uh, it was quite unexpected so um, every five year when we have presidential election uh, we have some kind of protests and uh, it's break down quite soon uh, and then uh, it's quite still for another five years uh, but 2020 it was a great breakthrough uh, but it appeared that country and the nation uh, was unprepared for that. We had no structures, uh, no parties, no political forces, uh, no support from uh, major businesses uh, to, to run this situation and to manage it. So our goal now is to build uh, these structures uh, and uh, th th the next time we have a window of opportunity for our protest, we'll have some, some ground that we could base on. And uh, BISOL is one of uh, these structures. Basically, it's kind of insurance for people who are repressed mm -hmm. uh, that they could have some support, some financial support, some uh, psychological support. And, That's uh, what you do with BISOL. Yeah, uh, yeah. so uh, we, we are trying to support people uh, if, uh, if they are repressed by the state. At the same time, uh, we have uh, a goal to um, support development of civil society. Mm -hmm. uh, to fund uh, initiatives, uh, grassroots initiatives uh, in, in local areas uh, and national level initiatives to, to build um, proper structures and institutions. Uh, and uh, that, that, that's where we collaborate with officers of Svetlana Tsikhanovska, because uh, they have political view of how to do it. Uh, we have a business view and fundraising uh, capacities uh, to support uh, these initiatives and structures. And uh, if you're talking about new structures, uh, it sounds a bit abstract. You already mentioned the civil society. You mean like uh, liberal democratic institu institutions are absent at the moment, or where, where should we? Like at the, at the moment, uh, Lukashenko's state is failing uh, in, in every place uh, they should run. Uh, so they're failing with healthcare, with education, uh, with... Um, <coughs> 
civil insurance, like with everything. So uh, we, uh, we we have to build our own working institutions. And, uh, and I've already mentioned when we talked previously, uh, we're developing some kind of uh, telemedicine solution which will help mm -hmm. doctors to work uh, outside of the state-owned hospitals, um, but still providing uh, help to patients uh, out there. Because and the health sector is state-owned. Yeah, it's state-owned, yeah. and starting with the COVID situation a year ago, uh, it's uh, failing dramatically. Uh, we, we have uh, around 1,000 uh, healthcare professionals, doctors, specialists, that have been fired uh, because of their political views, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, two or 3,000 of specialists uh, left their jobs because they just not agree with the situation. Uh, and uh, for relatively not big uh, countries, Belarus with 10 million population, that's a huge number, huge losses uh, for the healthcare itself. And um, um, you can add here lots of lots of uh, healthcare professionals died because of the COVID, mm -hmm. and we have uh, a terrific situation there. Uh, and yeah, I also have to mention the repressions that going on here. Y yesterday was actually uh, one of the most dramatic days this year for our protest uh, because the state decided to crush down to Dubai Media, uh, which is the, like a flagship of independent media in Belarus. Uh, and th that's a huge loss for whole of Belarus society because uh, we know from, from the past uh, when uh, dictator crushes down free media, uh, the next we have a huge wave of physical repression and uh, detaining of people and uh, lots of terrible stuff. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's also very personal because uh, th th that's basically my friends over there in, in Tutbai, the, the owner of Tutbai uh, was the first angel investor in, in our digital health company. Unfortunately, he passed away 17th of May last year. So two days ago, it was anniversary of, uh, of his death. And the very next day, uh, they attacked to Dubai. They blocked their office. Uh, and they blocked their website. Uh, they uh, detained uh, CEO of the company and um, uh, lots of stuff. Uh, and even widow of the previous owner, uh, she's missing now. Uh, we know that uh, she's been also detained, but by now we have we don't no know idea where she is. Where she is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I can add here as well, like about the structures. So, so there are several, uh, you know, organization and foundation. And the biggest one is Bisol. That's uh, the, the one that was mentioned. Uh, you know, there is groups as well of people that need the support, the sportsmen and cultural uh, people from culture, from music, from literature, etc., who have been expelled, uh, who have been kicked out from the country or who were well, needed to force to leave. And just as an example, just try to imagine that, for example, uh, I don't know, Arjen Robben or Wesley Snyder would face up to five years in jail only for uh, trying to help the, you know, the, the sportsmen. The sports people. That's what happened to 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 um, Olympic gold winner uh, Girasimenia. So she she is she is now facing up to five years uh, in jail just for you know creating this uh, you know solidarity campaign and uh, solidarity fund uh, mm -hmm. foundation for uh, for supporting sportsmen who decided not to to basically agree with with the regime. So that's that that's how how brutal it is. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about the last independent media out at being uh, sh shut down. It's also the question, what news will reach us here in Europe or in the Netherlands? Are you worried about that, Janis? Uh, yeah, I do, because uh, you see after, especially in the media sphere, you see it's, it's all about image. It's all about, you know, good picture, big picture. If there is no picture, then there is no interest. And this is, this is not uh, how it should be, because we cannot allow this fatigue over Belarus, because people suffer every day. People, uh, you know, uh, practically some of them are dying in prisons. Some of them were in hunger strikes. The detentions, you know, keep growing. And we have indeed, uh, that would not be an exaggeration if I said we have this uh, Chernobyl of human rights in Belarus. And we cannot allow this fatigue, uh, fatigue of, over, over, over Belarus. And for media, uh, for Western media, it's very important to have this constant, constant focus on, on Belarus. And, 
uh, you know, keep Belarus on top of the agenda and not only, you know, checking the picture. As I, as I mentioned before, even though there are not people on the streets, the protest, the desire of, of Belarusians to, to have freedom keeps, uh, keeps going. And the repressions, unfortunately, also keep going, um, keep growing. So in, in this yeah, regard, believe this is missing right yeah, now this, here. The focus is missing and uh, keep an agenda on daily and weekly basis. Which is important, you know, like this. Even even Tutbite thing, uh, which is big, which is huge, it's still not very widely picked up by by uh, you know all the Western media's. And we need to show the solidarity. Media needs uh, foreign media needs to show this solidarity with with Belarusian journalists repressed. So this this is highly important, and I encourage you and all the audience to 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 keep this focus and keep Belarus on top of the agenda. Thank you. And uh, Yaroslav, your organization by Soul, you also support people who want to get out of uh, Belarus. Is, is that difficult at the moment? Um, it, it depends. Uh, like, uh, that, that's a difficult question because um, uh, lots of people in Belarus now are under criminal pursuit, uh, and that, that means they are not able legally. Uh, leave the country uh, and uh, in in that case it's tricky to save them uh, from from prison uh, and pick them out of there but uh, it is so what you do also the, 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 try it to is do. it is what what we're trying to do and uh, quite often we're successful here um, quite often we know that um, someone uh, gonna be pursued it soon and uh, then we can uh, take him out of the country in advance. Uh, but we, at the same time we have a, a huge amount of refugees basically uh, in, in, in the neighboring country to Lithuania, Poland and Ukraine mostly. Also the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> it appears that we have s s some people even escaping to the Netherlands, uh, around seven I guess. Uh, but uh, if, if we are talking about Ukraine, Poland, Lithuania, we have uh, thousands and thousands. Uh, I guess n n now we are counting hundreds of thousands at the moment. Am I correct, Denis? Well, uh, hundreds of thousands, not sure, but it's tens of thousands, yeah. For sure. So we have lo lots of lots of people leaving the country, and, and that's the huge problem uh, for people itself and for European countries also, because mm -hmm. they have to be integrated, they have to be legalized, they have to find some jobs, and uh, th that's also a big problem we are facing with, uh, especially in Lithuania, where we're operating for the last eight months. Uh, and that's the same problem uh, facing our partners uh, in Poland and Ukraine, who's doing the same job there. Mm -hmm. And let's go a bit to this international context. You already mentioned the solidarity, uh, Janis. Uh, Svetlana Tikhanouskaya is meeting with several world leaders. She met with the German uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel, uh, the U ambas US ambassador to Belarus. You just came back from uh, Greece. Uh, what is discussed in, this, in these meetings? What, what do you expect from these uh, leaders? So uh, usually, uh, what we what we what we say is is this uh, support on three pillars: relever, pressure, justice, and solidarity. And also, in in particular, we can call them. We also call it EAP system. Uh, e stands for call for new elections. This is very important to be consistent in the decision of um, Western democracies. We didn't recognize Lukashenko, so they need to call, as we do, for new free and fair elections. Then uh, A would stand for uh, assistance. There is a huge need of technical assistance to uh, civil society, to human rights defenders, to independent media, especially now after this shutdown. This is hugely important to independent trade unions, uh, once again, to all the um, foundations like 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 BISOL, like uh, cultural foundation, sports foundation, uh, country for life, etc., etc. The ones who help, uh, you know, repressed people and uh, victims of, uh, of violence and people who are needed to force to leave the country. Uh, and uh, as well, A stands for accountability. It's very important to uh, keep accountable uh, the people uh, who participated in uh, crimes uh, and uh, in falsifying uh, elections. Uh, and P stands for uh, as well for pressure. Uh, we call for uh, sanctions. Uh, 
uh, once again, targeted sanctions, sanctions that do not harm people of Belarus, but only to people who once again participate in violence and falsifying elections, to judges who were uh, who put uh, unlawful decision to put people in prison, because uh, because these uh, these instruments they they do work, uh, they keep pressure on the regime, and they uh, keep this uh, they bring this this day of of negotiations uh, closer because uh, Lukashenko uh, will be and the regime will be willing to to negotiate only when they see this more pressure. So this is this is highly important and as well solidarity on bilateral level as well all the campaigns rallies every you see every every media interview every uh, every article every tweet every small step counts in this because it keeps Belarus on top of the agenda uh, so that that's mm -hmm. in a nutshell what uh, what we do discuss but as well what Yaroslav as well have mentioned before bilateral there are many ways how uh, each country and Netherlands in particular can help by uh, receiving repressed people uh, by helping them with 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 you know this temporary um, place of living and work uh, in, in 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 your country and uh, many cultural activities can be uh, can be as well uh, brought up mm -hmm. uh, for example doing residencies for 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 writers uh, doing conferences with expelled uh, um, students and fired faculty etc cetera, etc cetera. So this is this is this all of this brings you know um, very big value and keeps Belarus on top of the agenda and uh, hopefully that will bring as well to to negotiation that will lead to new uh, transparent elections. Yes, because as far as I know, at the moment there is no dialogue with. Uh, the, the opposition and the government of Lukashenko. So, and also, if you're talking about calling for free elections, putting pressure, um, it sounds also if there's a bit of a deadlock. If you cannot even have, like, if there are no negotiations at, at the moment, how how will you come where you want to end? That's right. Because uh, as soon as uh, the pressure is not enough, uh, they th they think that they can buy time. That they think that they can wait. They try to um, make this feeling for for Western country, for Western diplomats, for the society that everything is under control, that we will stabilize and normalize the situation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's not true. They're just you know lying and, and making this uh, as a feeling. But people inside the country, people who surround him, they understand that uh, this will not last long, and this is this is a very last day. So this is a question of. Uh, not a question of whether, but a question of when this will happen. So negotiation, new election will happen. But the question is with which cost, which price, and, and how fast. And we want to, this to happen uh, peacefully and to, uh, as fast as possible. So in, in this regard, this pressure is uh, extremely important. Mm -hmm. And, and this dialogue will happen again only, only if, they, uh, if they see the real actions. Because we hear and we have a lot of support, words of solidarity, but we need actions because actions uh, matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, Yaroslav, if you look at um, Ukraine, for example, where conflict started in 2014, it's still uh, a country in conflict. What, what do you expect uh, uh, when Lukashenko would leave, when his government would leave? Wouldn't you, uh, like, aren't you worried that uh, you're going to be disappointed? Uh, oh, I bet we will. <laughs> But not because of Lukashenko leaving, because we'll have lots of our own problems that we'll have to solve. But yeah, in the end, it's going to be our own problems, and uh, we'll probably find the solution. Um, I, I can compare a lot situation in, in Belarus uh, and in the Ukraine. I, I guess they're quite different. Of course. Um, first of all, Belarus and Ukraine just different countries. Uh, Belarus is much more monolith. Um, uh, we, we don't have that much difference between eastern and western mm -hmm. part of the country. Uh, and of course, if uh, um, our neighborhood in uh, regime from, from the east uh, going to take part in this conflict and uh, bring their military forces, then of course we, we could have quite the same situations we have in the Ukraine. Because but the question is also how do you make it better and how do you stop like new conflicts from flaring up? 
I, I, I cannot feel any conflict inside of Belarusian society at the moment. Uh, the, the society itself uh, is quite monolith. So we, we have a relatively small uh, band that um, occupying the country with a brute force. Uh, as soon as as we get rid of it, uh, people will just start rebuilding their homes and their cities, and it will st start slowly growing. Um, it will take long, and it's going to be painful, uh, but I think that that will make people happy, because mm -hmm. finally, in the end, they'll start building their own homes, uh, their own businesses, and their own places. Uh, that's what they are not able to to do for last, I guess, over than 100 years already, because f first it was Soviet Union, they didn't allow people to build something on their own uh, and repressing them a lot. Then we have very short period of time in the first half of 90s, when we started over again and we have some, some light in the end. But then Lukashenko came and he brought the Soviet practices back uh, and uh, it's not working again so yeah it's it's going to be lots of regression that things have changed have changed and it's now tough and difficult to build from scratch uh, but at least we're going to move forward and backwards mm -hmm. and and that matters yeah and uh, so I can just, just quickly uh, yeah Tepo, yes, i think course. the main difference is is that the revolution and the movement in Belarus from the very beginning, and I think it will remain as, 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 as it was, it was not about geopolitics. It was not about, you know, being closer to uh, European Union or being more far away from Russia. It was totally not about geopolitics. It was fully about pro-democracy and uh, anti-Lukashenko. So people of Belarus want democracy, they want rule of law, they want their rights to be respected. So it's not about the geopolitical uh, choice. But on the other hand, uh, I mean, we're still very close uh, with Ukraine. Our nations are, um, through the history, are very close. And I think we are close in the desire of, of this, uh, you know, uh, freedom. And everyone in Belarus and, and in Ukraine want to live better. And of course, with the democracy, uh, it's uh, easier, way, way easier to, to achieve. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, human rights group uh, say that uh, almost 35,000 people uh, were arrested since the protests uh, were flared up last summer. There are a lot of people uh, uh, detained, uh, opponents flee. There are also voices from protesters who say, who kind of give up hope and say, well, this, this revolution, it's, it's failed. How, how do you look at this? Well, you see, uh, lately we've received, um, well, one of the political prisoners uh, sent a letter uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to people um, who are free, and they say, look, guys, you outside of the country sometimes are more depressed than we are inside uh, prison. So uh, this, I think, well, we can understand that some people have this fatigue and maybe the depression, but uh, this is an important step that we need to overcome. So uh, this is this is uh, normal in any of the movements, you know, in any of the ways. So we just need to overcome. Say like, okay, that's at the step we are right now, and uh, we are building resources, keeping up the pressure, and uh, move forward. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that's obvious. That uh, right now, past is fighting with the future, and this that the mm, that this regime will not last long. So mm -hmm. it is very important to to keep focused and uh, not being. Uh, depressed uh, and thinking that, that, you know, this is that. Yeah, because for some it might feel there's no way out. If you see all the protests being uh, cracked down, you see your friends being in jail, uh, I can imagine that you're like, okay, what's it, what, what, what we're doing at the moment? Like, what's I, I, going to happen? I, guess, I guess the most important point is that everyone, both of the sides and even people who are trying to stay away from the conflict, uh, everyone totally understand that there is no way back. Mm -hmm. We cannot just jump back into July 2020 and imagine that everything going to be the old way. Lukashenko understands that he has to raise uh, the repressions and in increase the pressure on, on the society. A society understands that if they won't fight back, 
it will end in a very, very bad way, because today, uh, yesterday, again, the, the, the terrible day for, for all of our movement, for all of the Belarus, uh, the, the widow of uh, our past, past away friend, uh, she's been brought first to the hospital. Uh, and the first thing that I've did, uh, I've started calling doctors in the hospital, trying to find her and, and to, to find out something about her. And people just frightened to talk, just to talk and to, to provide any basic information. And that's pretty the same that I've been heard from my grandparents about what's been happening uh, in, in Soviet Union uh, in uh, 1937. So uh, society cannot live that way. Either, either we go all the way down to some kind of Northern Korea in, in, in the middle of Europe, uh, or we are keep pushing back and uh, we'll crack it down sooner than later. Uh, so as it no way back, we just have to keep pushing and continuing uh, our fight. And uh, Lukashenko doesn't have that much resources to last long. So maybe if we could mm -hmm. choose, we'll step back and uh, keep doing our own businesses. Mm -hmm. But we have no choice anymore. And uh, it's, of course, hard for outsiders or even uh, uh, people in Belarus to see how Lukashenko's government is doing, actually. Like if you're saying like he, he's almost out of resources. Uh, do you have, Janis, any idea of what's happening within the government? Like uh, some signs of, uh, is there also conflict within his own administration? Or do you have some information about this? Uh, from our side, we have established a, um, a platform called Dialogue to uh, open this uh, this connection with uh, with the regime and with people inside of you know administration and the ministries. And sometimes we uh, we receive information from you know several ministries, uh, some leaks, uh, some information. There is also a bipolar organization which is founded by former. Um, military and special forces people, and they also, you know, keep this uh, keep this channel by receiving uh, the communication from uh, from the regime. Uh, but at the same time, at the moment, you see these people who surround him, they 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 uh, they are, you know, counting the chances, and they see as soon as the that there is a disbalance, they would switch sides. So they select where uh, where this where where they will have future. What will the, what could this this balance mean or be? What this balance? As soon as they understand that Lukashenko, I mean, he is a, a you know a political bankrupt. But as soon as they feel it fully that there is there, he has no back, that he has totally no future, because he's still selling them this uh, idea of stabilization and normalization of the situation. And many of these people, you know, they saw it before. In uh, after the crackdown in 2010, after the crackdown in 2006. That they were thinking, okay, that it may stabilize, but as uh, Yaroslav rightly mentioned, there is no way back. So, uh, so this message for them that there is no way back uh, needs to be uh, backed up by decisive, concrete uh, measures. And for example, sanctions in this regard towards his wallets, people who are close to him, the businesses, uh, is a very right signal because as soon as they the sanctions are imposed on them, they understand that something is not right uh, in this uh, uh, in this uh, kingdom uh, and to understand correctly there are european sanctions now at uh, the government right yes, there are there are three packages now that there is a fourth package that is uh, being discussed and soon should be approved but this level of sanctions uh, is is significantly well it's pretty low if you even compare it with the sanctions that were imposed in 2011 uh, it's twice uh, the list of, of uh, is twice shorter, and the level of repression, if you compare the level of repression of uh, 2021 with 2010, 11, it's incomparable. You've mentioned yourself: 35,000 people detained. We have 3,000 criminal cases, almost 400 political prisoners, uh, hundreds of people who've been tortured, and tens of thousands who've been forced to leave the country. This is this is a disaster. And still, this uh, list and level of sanctions that we've been imposed, these three packages. Uh, what kind is, of sanctions do we need? Can you explain? It's targeted sanctions towards uh, um, people, uh, wallets of Lukashenko, this 
uh, people who participated in uh, violence, people who participate in falsifying elections. So this is a very targeted, targeted sanctions. Mm -hmm. And did uh, any so European cronies. leaders, sorry? Towards his cronies, mostly people mm -hmm. who support mm -hmm. him. Because, you know, sometimes uh, other countries think, OK, well, we don't support the regime. We support, well, it's just business as usual. But uh, you see, you, people need to understand that uh, Lukashenko doesn't, and his regime uh, doesn't, does use this money for, uh, you know, for batons and, and water cannons to suppress people. So that's, that's, that should be pretty mm -hmm. clear that this, uh, this business with, with him and with the regime uh, brings uh, a lot of pain to, towards... Uh, peaceful protesters. And did European and leaders you know, make any promises? Protests. Like, even for small things, you see, people now, just to understand the level of repression, people now can be detained only for wearing white, red, white socks. Imagine that you walk, I don't know, in front of Rijks Museum in Amsterdam, holding uh, white, red, white tulips, flowers, and only for that you've been detained and, you know, can mm -hmm. be fined. That's for what people are being now, you know, repressed in Belarus. For, I don't know, a person had a box of LG t TV, which has, which is also white with a red emblem of LG and white. I don't know if I'm able to say LG on television, but still. <laughs> and he'd been detained for that, just for having this, 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 this box of television in his balcony. So this is, this is, uh, this is insane. Yeah, we it, cannot uh, it, imagine uh, this here happening here. Yes, yes. Uh, just but, for the small things people get... But why are these sanctions not put into practice then? I mean, you talk to a lot of leaders also in Europe. You, you, you say very clear, this is what we need. Uh, there are two, uh, like a few sanctions at the moment. So why don't, doesn't Europe act? I, well, because uh, there are lobbyists who, who lobby against, against the sanctions and saying that sanctions shouldn't be imposed. So that's why we need uh, a country in Europe, and perhaps it can be Netherlands, who would be, you know, champion this uh, this this initiative? Who would be, you know, uh, saying that this is this is important, that this is needed to be done? So we need a broader coalition of countries, like a champion who would, who would, uh, you know, push it forward. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. There is a Belarusian tobacco. So there is a what? Tobacco. Yes. Tobacco. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds awkward, but there is some Belarusian tobacco factories, uh, and they're smuggling their cigarettes to Europe for years for millions of euros every month. Uh, they're smuggling it through Lithuania and Poland. Mm -hmm. Until recently, it was no problem for Lithuanian and Polish customers. Uh, recently, they start paying attention to it, and, and uh, they're busting uh, lots of these cigarettes, like every time for two, three, five millions of euros. Uh, and that's, that's, the, that's the money uh, that Lukashenko is, is paying uh, to, to his police forces. Uh, but for years, these cigarettes have been smuggling to Europe, and that means that someone in these European countries got their cut. The same works with oil, with potash, and with uh, some else that he's trading to Europe. Of course, if, if the Netherlands itself uh, buying some oil from Belarusian oil refinery, uh, here are some people that are interested in doing this business. Because the prices on this oil is much lower than uh, buying from, from the Emirates or Norway or US. And it's, uh, it's profitable to work with, with Belarusian oil refineries. But that's the money that goes directly into Lukashenko's pocket. So as soon as we cut it off, as soon as we start uh, putting um, his pocket businesses under the sanctions, people who run in these businesses support him no more. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the first thing I think we, we have to do. The, the second thing, we, we, like, Lukashenko is based on three points. Money from the businesses he, uh, he controls, and like he, he've been proud that there is no oligarchy in Belarus, but in fact he's the only oligarch that controls all of the major businesses there. So we have to cut it for him, first of all. The second uh, thing he based on is uh, the network of ideologists in country. And here we have to support civil society to fight back against them. As soon as they feel enough pressure, 
they're stepping back and they're not supporting Lukashenko anymore. And the third thing, one of, again, very important, uh, the police forces uh, themselves. Uh, and the police forces are very Russia-oriented. So as long as uh, Putin uh, backing them up, uh, they will keep fighting because they know in any event, if everything goes wrong, they can flee uh, back to Moscow or St. Petersburg or any other Russian mm -hmm. town and find a new job there. So if Europe, together with US, will put enough pressure uh, into Kremlin and make them step down on supporting Lukashenko, the very next day, the police forces will turn Lukashenko down. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's three quite clear points that we, we have And also paid. a change of attitude which is needed, like maybe move a bit away from pragmatism, because you talked about the, yeah. the oil, the, the Yeah, sure. The like oil I, I, and I barely understand how politics works, because I'm, I'm from business, mm -hmm. but I understand that there are some interests and politics are not interested in, in taking additional risks uh, in their campaigns. So um, we have to bring this agenda to media and uh, to, to make local society mm -hmm. to push into their politics, because we're talking about neighboring to European Union country. It's, it's not somewhere in, in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. it ju it's just next to the EU border. And uh, if, if we'll have uh, th this kind of problems next to EU border, uh, that could easily hurt the Europe itself, uh, starting with, with the refugees and uh, it, it could be a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, if we have uh, the, this kind of totalitarian regime, regime um, developing right next to European borders, uh, it could affect the Europe. So we, we, we have to do something. Where about are we waiting for? Yes. Yeah. And you're talking about local action. I actually have a, a final question to you uh, both, Johnny, starting with you. If we're thinking about Dutch citizens, uh, like, what would there be a call to action to them? Like, what's, what, what can they do? So, first of all, again, raising the Belarusian issue within the societies and communities uh, in, in, in the Netherlands. Urge your government to take decisive actions to, to solve the crisis in Belarus. Ask them to be the leader, the champion of, of solving this crisis uh, within European Union. Uh, on a very personal level, everyone can write letters to political prisoners, and that helps to, you know, keep their spirits and uh, is very much appreciated by them. You can also organize, again, back to solidarity, organize rallies and campaigns uh, for um, stand with Belarus, solidarity with Belarus in, in every city, in every town it can be done. Uh, once again, helping uh, organizations like BISOL, uh, Country for Life, uh, Sports Solidarity, Cultural Solidarity, Medical Solidarity Foundations with, uh, with resources and as well with connections. It's very important to connect people. Everyone has you know, connections that, that can help. So this is, I think, five practical steps that every and each Dutch citizen uh, can do and help uh, Belarusians in their fight for democracy. Yaroslav, is there some kind of petition also people maybe can sign or...? Uh, yeah, Dennis brought a good point. If uh, the Netherlands could be a champion inside of the EU who's driving this, uh, th this problem, it could help a lot because the Netherlands is one of the founding fathers of, of, European, of, of the European Union and uh, their voice means a lot. So if, uh, if the Dutch parliament uh, or members of European parliament fr from the Netherlands uh, could uh, raise up this agenda over and over again and push in, uh, towards sanctions and to, uh, toward political uh, steps, uh, support in Belarus, that would help a lot. But besides that, I'd propose three, uh, three basic steps that, that, that we can um, go for. Um, first of all, uh, that's the, the politics of a good neighborhood uh, and uh, to, to open some doors for Belarusians because we have over there 10 millions of well-educated European mind and European culture people uh, that are in very tough conditions, uh, economically, politically, and in, in every other way. Uh, it's, it's very, very tough for them. If we could open some doors for them, 
um, to to enable them uh, to run their business inside European Union, uh, to to find jobs in European Union, uh, to um, study in, in in Dutch universities and universities uh, o over EU. That would help a lot, and, and they will feel a lot of support uh, f from Europe, uh, and it it will encourage them that they have bright future and someone cares for them. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the second thing uh, is it's smart support. So uh, we uh, we like we, we know that we have some problems. I, I am working in in, in in the healthcare field, so I know about some problems in healthcare. I know that uh, we have lack of specialists here, uh, especially uh, during the COVID time, and we know that healthcare professions in Belarus they they, they need work there. It, it's it's a perfect match uh, on top of my mind. We c we can use workforce from Belarus to help out Dutch uh, patients, uh, uh, and uh, in that way will help Belarusian doctors to earn something and feel themselves free uh, out this pressure of the regime. Uh, and uh, we have lots of various initiatives, and uh, this uh, I'm I'm running solidarity fund. Uh, so basically, Netherlands can, can help with funds uh, supporting these initiatives, uh, developing civil society, developing democracy initiatives, uh, and um, and sharing also experience how to build it, because mm -hmm. uh, Netherlands have hundreds of years of democracy, and they can definitely teach us something. And, and the third thing, uh, also very important, uh, I'm living in The Hague, a city of peace and justice, uh, and uh, there are lots of terrible crimes going on now in Belarus, and we have some, um, some ways using universal jurisdiction uh, to put people who are committing these crimes in Belarus uh, under criminal the accountability, uh, where the accountability, uh, yeah, yeah, about, yeah, here, here in Europe, we've, we've already started uh, this kind of work in Lithuania, uh, and I know that uh, it, uh, there've been projects discussed uh, about tribun tribunal here in, in the Hague. Uh, so that's uh, th that's probably what Netherlands are very good at. Uh, so support uh, in this mm -hmm. way and uh, with this track will also help a lot. Yeah. Well, we have a, a lot of work to do here in the Netherlands. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for this conversation, your insights, and uh, I wish you uh, all the luck with your campaigns, uh, with uh, your work. And at May 26, we have our next episode, which is about the war in uh, Yemen. So keep an eye on our website. Uh, I hope to see you then and have a very nice evening.